My name's Elizabeth Moran. I'm Director of Education and Research here at FIG. Uh, unfortunately today, Tony Perkins wasn't able to be with us, uh, so we have Henry Stewart, Associate Director of Investment Strategy, stepping in for Tony. Henry has a wide background in uh, RMBS and has been an RMBS analyst in the past. He's worked at FIG for three years and uh, works closely with our origination team, which I'm sure that you, that you know. But uh, welcome, Henry. Thank you for joining us. We'll now, I'll now hand over to you and we'll commence the presentation. Good morning, Liz and everyone else on the call. Um, thanks very much for that introduction. I suppose I'd mention that the most relevant part of what my role has been at FIG is that for the last two and a half years, I've been the primary RMBS analyst, uh, putting together all the sort of sales collateral that you would have seen from the desk when they're presenting RMBS opportunities to you. And so it's very much in, in that mind that we've got this presentation today. And it's going to look to achieve a couple of things. Firstly, it's going to go through a little bit of what the market for RMBS looks like and its importance within our economy, if you like, and it's then going to talk through the basic, te the basic technology that allows for RMBS structures to work. And what we see is that while they're hindered by expectations of them being overly complicated and uh, you know, opaque and not transparent, what we see is that once you get down to the underlying structure, they're quite simple and I think particularly appropriate for you know, a high net worth or self-managed super fund investor who has a genuine view on Australian property markets to be investing in. We then talk about some of the more technical features of how these transactions fit together, how the ratings agencies look at these transactions because that's often one of the easiest ways where you can identify what sort of RMBS you're looking at is to have a look at the ratings agency's analysis. And finally, we're going to walk through a case study of um, it's actually it's a real offer that we showed to our clients on, I believe, Monday or Tuesday this week. Um, and we're going to step you through that so you can have a look at, first, how we present that, and then secondly, exactly how to read uh, the sort of information that we will provide to you when we're showing RMBS opportunities to you. And so I think we can, we can kick forward. And if we just jump to the next slide as well. So broadly speaking, when we, when we look at RMBS, we see that they provide a real opportunity for wholesale investors. And we should say right up at the top of the call that these are products which we do only make available to wholesale investors due to the sort of the level of sophistication and complexity that's perceived to be associated with them. And there are a few reasons why we think they provide a real opportunity. Firstly, they offer a true spectrum of risk. Uh, you can access RMBS, which are rated anywhere from AAA um, for the most senior lines, the most senior pieces of an RMBS transaction. That's the same rating, for example, as the Commonwealth of Australia. That's a higher rating, for example, than the United States of America or you know, the state of Queensland. You can access AA minus rated for the junior notes in prime transactions. So that's the same rating as Australia's four major banks. It's also incidentally the same rating as the senior rating on Genworth Financial Mortgage Insurance and QBE Lenders Mortgage Insurance, uh, which are the two main providers of mortgage insurance in Australia and that's how those notes get that rating. And then for non-conforming transactions or transactions which aren't covered by mortgage insurance, you'll have them seeing ratings between single A all the way down to single B. And this means that if you're an investor and you're looking at these structures, you can clearly define the level of risk which you want to take on uh, and target that part of the RMBS structure. The second thing, uh, or the second reason why we think that they're a compelling opportunity for investors to look at is because they offer quite compelling relative value and a high yield in compared to what you'd see as comp comparably rated securities. For example, if I'm looking at a five-year senior bank paper from a AA minus rated institution, I'd expect to get a yield well south of 100 basis points over the relevant swap rate for that. If I'm looking at a AA minus rated junior 
RMBS note in a prime transaction, so the same rating as a senior piece of bank paper, uh, you'd be looking at getting almost 6.5%, call that 300 basis points over the relevant swap rate. Um, when we start looking lower than those AA minus rated pieces, if we start looking at uh, you know, the single A through to single B rated pieces, which are more junior in the structure, we find that even in today's current low yielding environment, uh, yields of you know, up to and even over 10% uh, available for investors. We think that for investors who are willing to do the work and learn how these uh, learn how these structures work and get comfortable with the underlying risk that they're taking, that this offers a really compelling relative value opportunity uh, within the fixed income space. And that's really why for the last several years since the middle of 2011, FIG's really been wanting to educate our wholesale investors regarding the benefits of RMBS. We accept that they are you know, structurally complex, however we believe that uh, if we can bring investors along with us on a journey uh, and educate them about how these structures work so that they truly understand it and understand the risks that are associated with it, then it really does create a uh, you know, compelling opportunity as part of a balanced portfolio. So I suppose what we're going to step through here is just a broad analysis of what the market for RMBS is like in Australia and, and why that's important. So here we've got four graphs and we're going to step through each of them in turn. Now these are all produced by uh, the RBA in association with a variety of other groups and they're regularly updated by the RBA as a representation of the fact that this is, this is you know, quite an important part of the market. So in the top left hand corner we see a graph titled Funding Composition of Banks in Australia and what we see is that you, you have two trends which you can really view there. One is the fact that as we were leading towards the GFC uh, up until 2008 we had a strong ramp up in the amount of securitization, and let's use securitization as uh, another word for RMBS in this instance, uh, in the, the share of total funding for Australian banks. That's the pink line at the bottom when we saw that it almost reached 10% of the total amount of funding. Now since the GFC, you initially had markets close off, uh, which is why you had that sharp drop off, and you had banks turn substantially more to funding themselves through domestic deposits. Uh, since then, however, particularly in the last 12 months, we've seen the Australian securitization market really pick up with multi-billion dollars of issuance uh, in, the, in the first half this year. If we step to the second graph there titled Australian RMBS in the top right, we can again see uh, that story which I was describing there, where in the lead up to the GFC you had a substantial amount of issuance. Um, you know, north of north of 20 billion in 2007 there, and then as we go forward, it dropped off almost entirely. And as we move forward through to today, we see it increasingly being tapped more and more. Now, the other important thing to note in that graph is the bottom half of it, and that shows the pricing. So here we can see that before the GFC, you had incredibly tight pricing. Just last week I was looking at a transaction where the most junior note in the transaction was paying a coupon of the bank bill swap rate plus 36 basis points. That's incredibly tight. Um, what we've seen is that that gapped out pretty substantially around the time of the GFC and it's now starting to come back in. Uh, the resting point presently for senior paper uh, in RMBS transactions is around about 90 to 100 basis points over the bank bill swap rate, keeping in mind that all RMBS do tend to prices or be structured as floating rate notes and not fixed rate notes. Uh, jumping to the bottom left, we have a look at the outstanding volume of RMBS and this is further reinforcing the story we've, we've been hearing um, a fair bit, which is that uh, you had substantial issuance which led to a large corpus of RMBS outstanding pre-GFC which slowly uh, which slowly rolled off and yet now it's rested at a new sort of natural level uh, which banks are issuing into again. The other interesting thing to notice in that graph is the yellow portion in the middle mark AOFM. What that represents is where the Australian government uh, directed the Australian Office of Financial Management who's responsible for all of Australia's debt issuance and a variety of other um, responsibilities to actually 
go out and ensure that it was purchasing senior RMBS to help keep competition alive in mortgage-backed markets. Now that tells us a couple of things. That tells us that the government doesn't just believe in this market, it's willing to put its money on the line in its belief in this market. It also shows you how the securitization market is essential for the correct functioning of Australia's residential property financing um, and it really enables additional competition in that sector by allowing for non-bank lenders to have access to funding and be able to provide compellingly priced alternatives to the mortgages which you can go and get from the major banks. Finally, we have a look at uh, the graph on the bottom right hand corner, Australian banks wholesale issuance and this is if you ignore uh, deposits and equity in how the banks are funding themselves, how that breaks down. Um, obviously in 2009 you had um, a lot of unsecured issuance which was also benefited from a government guarantee which is why that amount is so high there. Um, a lot of that was done at the start of 2009 near the end of 2008. Uh, we've seen in the last few years the uh, beginning of a covered bond market which is slightly taken away from the RMBS market as it's another way of moving uh, residential mortgages which, sits, which sit on bank balance sheets off balance sheet and allow them to be funded at compelling rates, but we again see the volumes of securitization in the lead up to the GFC, which is the light blue or purple uh, part of the graph. It was quite high 2008 through 2011, it was sort of recovering and then in 2013 we saw a really strong figure. We've seen that reflected again uh, in 2014 um, and we're on track to uh, have even higher levels of issuance this year. I think what we see from this is that RMBS, despite uh, predominantly not being in front of Australian mum and dad high net worth self-managed super fund type investors, is a really genuine and large part of the Australian fixed income market. Uh, it's traditionally wholly been the province of the institutional investor. However, what these graphs show is that it genuinely is substantial. Um, and to the extent that it provides compelling relative value and can pay you a yield that uh, makes you think that it's appealing to you, that this is definitely a credible market um, that you can be comfortable investing in. I suppose if we're looking um, to expand that idea of credibility, let's have a look at some of the issuers. Um, who issue into this market. And we see that they include all the big four. They include all of our uh, you know, next tier of banks. It includes a substantial number of regional lenders. And then it also includes uh, two other groups that I've mentioned. It includes prime non-bank lenders. And these are people like Resimac and Firstback uh, who operate on a model similar to the one you're probably most familiar with was uh, RAMS back during uh, the mid-2000s to late-2000s. They offer products that compete with the banks and they fund them through securitization markets. Now it also includes several other lenders who write both prime and non-conforming or subprime loans. They include uh, the Bluestone Group, Liberty Financial and Pepper. Now Liberty and Pepper also write prime loans, um, but their real expertise sort of sits in that subprime area. What we see is that this is a market that's tapped by a wide variety of participants from household names to very specialist lenders. You know, the fact that you have the CBA all the way through to Liberty Financial issuing um, into this market is further indication of you know, its depth and its breadth, not to mention its credibility. So I suppose what we're going to do through these next few slides is just briefly talk about exactly what these products look like. Um, and, and on this slide you see a, a quite simple diagram. What we have is we have a, a bank or a non-bank lender take a variety of home loans, a you know, substantial number in a new transaction, let's call it 2,000, and they transfer those into a special purpose trust which now owns them. In return, the special purpose trust pays the bank uh, you know, full face value of those loans. Now where does this, where does this trust uh, get that money from? Well what it does is it issues RBS notes to investors and investors pay for those. 
So you've now got a situation where before you had mortgages sitting on a bank balance sheet, they've been transferred into a special purpose trust uh, and in order to fund that they've issued RMBS notes to investors who paid for that. The proceeds um, of those payments are used to fund the purchase of this pool of mortgages. Now if we think about a bank and how it runs its business, how it runs its residential mortgage business, obviously there are a whole heap of things that have to go on. Now a lot of that exists in the process of originating the mortgages, that's having mortgage brokers out there, it's having branches on uh, street corners where people can go in and inquire about a branch you know, and that's a, that's a lot of the cost that's associated with it. But then even once you've got the mortgage has been established, the, the borrower's signed up, he's bought his house, uh, you've got a whole heap of things which need to be continue to happen on an ongoing basis. You need to send that person uh, you know, monthly bills saying what interest and principal is due. You need to set the interest rate on that. If someone goes into arrears, you need to be able to manage that, remind them that they are and um, if things don't get resolved, then start to begin a uh, foreclosure process. You need to, to the extent that you offer any fixed rate loans um, or a fixed rate portion of a loan, you need to be able to swap that out into a floating rate. These are all things which banks do on a, on a daily basis to manage the mortgages that they, uh, that they have originated. And this special purpose trust, by virtue of the fact that it owns a, a large number of mortgages, it needs to be able to do all those things as well. Um, and so you have a variety of uh, different service providers providing those services to the, the special purpose trust. You also need a few uh, additional things to service or to deal with the fact that you do have notes on issue and you need to manage your relationship with investors as well, but they're quite typically uh, what you'd see with a normal bond transaction. You're going to have trustees of the like of uh, you know, Perpetual, the largest trustee in Australia, uh, Bank of New York Mellon, the largest um, trustee in the world tend to be the two uh, who get used for RMBS transactions, and we see that all of the other um, all of the other roles in this transaction tend to be the sponsoring bank themselves, or a related entity of that sponsoring bank. the The point of this slide, if you like, is to show that the various roles that are played within an within a normal bank scenario. Um, the people who service the loans, the people who service loans that are in trouble, that are in arrears, um, you know, the provision of bank accounts where money's come into and out of. In an RMBS structure, all of those roles are still played by the exact same people and so all the same technology that sits behind um, a major bank in Australia running its mortgage servicing operation sit behind the way that RMBS trusts uh, run their mortgage servicing operation and that gives you comfort in the uh, degree of quality and competence of the various steps in the process between the end holder of the mortgage, the borrower um, and, and you as a note investor being paid. And so we get to really the heart um, of what an RMBS transaction is. And the easiest way to begin to think about this is to know that the underlying assets that that, that trust owns is a variety, a large number of mortgages. Now, what are some features of mortgages um, in Australia that we know? Well, the vast majority of them are variable rate mortgages and as a result of that, the RMBS, which uh, spit out of the other side of the trust uh, are floating rate prepayable FRNs. Now they need to be FRN, so they need to be prepayable by virtue of the fact that if you think about your normal Australian mortgage product, it's a 30 year uh, principal and interest loan. And each payment that you make on your mortgage, I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, will include an interest portion and it will also include a small repayment of principal. Now then the next thing to, to keep in mind is that it's very unusual in the Australian market for someone to actually keep uh, a mortgage for 30 years and just slowly pay it down at the scheduled amounts. Uh, people tend to either move houses in which they'll wholly refinance their mortgage, um, they will they'll pay it down more quickly if they receive a, a, you know, a pay rise or a bonus or an inheritance. Um, you know, there are a variety of reasons 
uh, why people would pay their loan down more quickly, and then also a variety of reasons in which people would refinance their loan entirely. Um, in all of those instances, the RMBS transaction needs to be able to, when principal is repaid on the underlying loans, use that money to repay principal on on the the RMBS the RMBS notes themselves, the liabilities of this trust. Um, so. The other important concept which is described on this slide is the idea of over collateralization in the actual underlying pool of mortgages. And this is pretty easy to understand if you think about the fact that if I want to go to, let's call it the CBA today and get a loan, uh, it's going to be substantially easier for me to do so if I'm willing to put 20% of the cost of the property I wish to purchase up front. And so what we see is that in the Australian uh, RMBS market, if you look at the average pool of mortgages, you tend to have a weighted average LVR. LVR there stands for loan to value ratio. It's essentially the uh, proportion of the value of the property that you're purchasing that you're borrowing. Um, you tend to have a weighted average LVR of about 60 to 70 percent on new transactions. Obviously, the, as those transactions age in time, uh, borrowers tend to pay down their mortgages, the principal on their mortgages further, um, you know, better improving your security position because you've got further over collateralization on those underlying loans. So essentially what that trust does is it takes all of the principal and interest uh, income that's coming off those underlying loans and it uses those to pay down the various obligations that it has. Uh, on the RMBS notes and it actually segregates the cash that it receives into two very clear pools. It separates into principal and it separates it into interest. It uses the interest that is earned on the underlying mortgages to pay interest on the RMBS notes and it uses principal that's earned on the underlying mortgages to pay down principal on the underlying RMBS notes. In this way we refer to them as pass through notes because they do pass through all the cash flows that they receive uh, to, to investors in the liability side of the trust, the RMBS note investors. The final important concept to appreciate from this slide is the final dash point there on the left, the note of sub, the idea of subordination. Now what that means, if you look at the quite simplified RMBS structure that we have on the right where we've got 95% of the transaction which is AAA rated senior RMBS and we've got 5% of the transaction is AA minus rated junior RMBS. What we do when we take all the interest that we've received from those underlying mortgages is we first pay the interest on the senior notes and we second pay um, interest on those junior notes. So those junior notes only get paid interest if there's sufficient uh, cash left over after paying interest on the senior notes um, in order to pay them. And then to the extent that there's anything left over, um, we call that excess spread. And the sponsor of the transaction, so the originating bank, um, in the example we've kind of been using, it'll be the CBA, uh, each period to the extent that there's excess income, that actually gets paid to them and that's you know, their profit for having originated all these loans if you like. Uh, and now if we jump to the, the next slide, we're going to see uh, quite explicitly what happens with income. So I talked about the waterfall there being used to pay uh, interest on the senior notes before the junior notes. There are a few extra things that um, happen in there. Uh, obviously you need to pay tax, you need to pay those various parties who are um, a part of the transaction like the servicer, uh, the trustee, um, parties like that. All those although those expenses do tend to be reasonably de minimis. Uh, you then pay your senior note interest, your junior note interest, uh, to the extent that there are any losses that have been experienced in the current period, so principal losses on loans which you've been forced to foreclose upon. Um, income would be used to uh, cover them. To the extent that there were any losses in prior periods which weren't able to be covered by income in that prior period, you'd use income in this period to pay them and only after you've covered all of those things uh, does that excess spread get returned to uh, the, the sponsoring bank and that will happen depending on the transaction on either a monthly or a quarterly basis. Principles a little bit more simple. Um, the important concept to grasp is that we do wholly separate 
amounts received by way of principal from amounts received by way of income in the cash receipts that we get from the underlying borrowers in the pool. And we take that principal and we use that to repay um, the body of notes on offer. And we do that in such a way to ensure that if the loan balance of the mortgages that I own uh, goes down by $10 million, then I'll also ensure that the total amount of debt that the structure has, so the total amount of RMBS notes um, that are on offer um, from the trust also goes down by $10 million and this ensures uh, that the amount of income that's being generated on the underlying mortgages will always be sufficient to service the uh, RMBS notes because as their principal balance, so as the principal balance of the mortgages goes down, the principal balance of the RMBS notes goes down accordingly. Okay, Henry, it's Liz here. I've got a question from Carol. She just wants to know if you have a $10 million um, repayment of principal, is it shared equally between the AAA RMBS note holders and the AA minus RMBS note holders, or is it like a capital structure where the whole $10 million would go to the AAA tranche first? So that's a really good question. We're going to get to a, a concrete example of how that um, specifically applies later on. But as a general rule, what happens is that in the early periods of the transaction, all that principal will be used to repay the most senior note holders. Uh, what we see is that after usually 50% of the transactions paid down, you'll actually start uh, using that principal to equally repay both the senior note holders and the junior note holders. Now the logic behind why you do that is because obviously you're paying a higher coupon or a higher rate of interest on those junior notes because uh, they have a, a relatively riskier position. Uh, and so if I'm just paying down all the senior notes, then actually my sort of weighted average cost of capital of this uh, transaction is increasing every period. Um, proportionally, I've got less of the senior notes and I've got more of the junior notes and the junior notes have a higher interest amount. So the sort of agreement um, that was reached and the way that structures, RMBS structures are operated in Australia is that once the transaction is paid down by 50%, uh, then you start sharing the principal amongst both the senior note holders and the junior note holders. Why do senior note holders agree to this after the transaction is paid down by 50%? Well, let's imagine that on day one, the junior note represented 5% of um, the total transaction. Imagine we're dealing with a billion dollar transaction. The junior note would represent $50 million of that. By the time half of the principal on the underlying loans is paid down, then you've got a total of $500 million of RMBS notes outstanding. You've got a total of $500 million of underlying mortgages which are servicing those RMBS notes and you've still got $50 million of junior notes which provide you know, hard equity to absorb any losses before the senior note holders have to take a hit if losses do happen which can't be covered by excess spread. So it seems reasonable to argue that because proportionally uh, or proportionately the amount of support you're getting from that junior note has increased from 5% of the transaction to 10% of the transaction, that the senior note holders are willing to start uh, sharing that principle with the junior RMBS note holders in order to have the ultimate benefit of keeping the, ult the total interest cost um, that you're paying on your RMBS notes as low and manageable as possible. Thanks very much, Henry. We'll move on to the next slide. So we've talked about um, the concept of as principal gets repaid on the underlying mortgages, it gets used to repay the RMBS notes which have been issued to fund their purchase. And this, because it happens you know, as and when principal go, gets repaid on the mortgages, you can imagine that this creates a bit of a problem because I don't necessarily know with the same degree of certainty as I would with a uh, regular fixed income investment when those payments are going to happen. Now as it turns out, I do know with a reasonably high degree of certainty how that's going to happen because I've got a lot of historical data and I know how Australian borrowers tend to pay down, uh, or we know how Australian borrowers tend to pay down uh, their mortgages. And what we see is a broad rule that differs from transaction to transaction a little bit and it, issues, it differs from issuer to issuer or originator to originator a little bit. But as a broad rule of thumb, we see that of every dollar um, of mortgages outstanding in Australia in 
over the course of a given year, 20 cents of that will get repaid. Now that sounds, at first brush, really, really high. Um, because we know that if you're paying off a mortgage, um, principal and interest, then you know of every check that you send into the bank, substantially less um, of that is principal than it is interest, and it's very unlikely that you'd be paying off um, you know twenty percent of your mortgage balance in a year. These are thirty-year mortgages after all. However, what we see is that there are a couple of different ways that you can have principal get repaid. It's not just the small amount that you make in your monthly. Um, in your monthly payment. So the other ways include people prepaying uh, their people. People prepaying uh, their mortgage balance, and that can happen when they've received an inheritance, a bonus, a um, you know increase in pay, uh, or most importantly, when people refinance their entire loan which essentially represents them repaying all the principal at once. Now they can refinance their loan for a couple of reasons. They can refinance their loan because they're moving to a new house. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't know many people uh, who've been living in the same property for, for 30 years. Uh, or they can refinance it simply because they are able to get a better rate from another financial institution. If you combine all of those factors together, what you see is that on average you see about 20% uh, of the principal balance of a given mortgage uh, repay over the course of a 12-month period. Let's have a look at that in aggregate because you have in the first year you go from let's say 100 cents to 80 cents. Um, you then have 20% of 80 cents repay in the second year, so you go from 80 cents to it's going to be minus 16 cents, which is going to get you to 64 cents, and that's going to continue down. So it's not like you're going to expect it to be wholly repaid within five years. This is sort of uh, an example of exponential decay. Uh, but what we see is that you're going to have about 5% of that transaction left uh, within within six years. You have about 10% of the transaction left. Uh, Around about the you know, four and a half to five and a half year period, depending on you know whether it's twenty percent or it's twenty one percent or it's nineteen percent, uh, you know it's normally going to be around that area, um, and that's how we see these principal amounts being repaid. Now, if you were never to have the transaction to get called, uh, if you were to just have principal get repaid to the RMBS notes as and when. Uh, it got repaid on the underlying mortgages, then what you'd see is that you'd have an incredibly long tail um, on these notes because you know there are going to be the the few exceptions, the people who do keep their mortgage for the full 30 years, and and those people, um, those people's mortgages have to be funded, and the RMBS notes would do that. However, what we see is that in reality, and if we jump to the next slide, um, in order to guard against that problem, uh, we have the issuing institutions agree that once they reach, once the transaction reach either a certain date, um, for example it might be three years into the transaction, uh, or it reaches a certain amount of the transaction um, that's still outstanding, for example it might be there's 10% of the transaction left, then the issuing institutions or the originating bank, the CBA and the example we've been using as we go along, uh, they'll call the transaction. So they'll buy all the mortgages back and pay out the RMBS note investors. Now obviously that's something that is at the option of uh, the sponsoring bank and it's not an obligation of theirs, it's a, you know, it's a call option they have and I'm sure you're familiar with call risk from um, other fixed income products. Um, but what we see is that in Australia issuers have been uh, very good. Uh, with calling their transactions the first available opportunity. As far as the distinction between that 10% um, based outstandings call uh, and the date based calls, we tend to see that if the sponsoring organisation is an ADI, that's to say they're a bank and they're issued by and they're regulated by APRA, then they're only allowed uh, to do those outstandings based calls at 10%. Uh, APRA won't let them call it before that. One of the key benefits actually of uh, investing in transactions which are sponsored by non-bank lenders like uh, Resimac or Pepper or Bluestone uh, or, or Liberty is that they have the ability to hit date-based calls. So they can commit to, I will, you know, I have the option to call this transaction on the 17th of July 2017. And so you know that there's a, 
a certain final end date there. Well, of course, there is uh, the risk um, that they won't choose to exercise that call. Uh, one sort of key offender in that area probably has been uh, the Bluestone Group, uh, which after the GFC failed to call several transactions when they were first able to. Uh, and knowledge of what various issuers' call history is like, that's one of the you know, the key things which uh, FIG's able to help educate you on whenever we provide you with uh, a specific RMBS you know, investment opportunity. Okay, Henry, we have a quick question from Han, and he's asked, do you get notice of possible impending early calls? Uh, so on the concept of an early call, I think, is, a, is an interesting concept to deal with. Um, so what we see is that the vast majority of issuers uh, have called every single transaction that they've had outstanding at the first available opportunity. Um, and so we know when that first available opportunity is coming because it's either a date-based call, in which case it tells you uh, this is able to be called from, you know, for example, the 30th of July in 2017, or it's an outstanding space call and I know how much um, is outstanding because I can look at the fact that this is a billion dollar transaction when it first issued, it's now got $110 million left. All right, it's coming up close to that 10% threshold. It's going to be eligible to be called. When you're dealing with issuers who haven't uh, called all their transactions on the first available opportunity, uh, it becomes slightly trickier. Um, FirstMac, for example, is I think notorious uh, for not um, being particularly transparent with when they're going to call their transactions. Uh, Bluestone, as I mentioned, failed to call transactions for several years and then came out and, and did call it. Unfortunately, um, you have to make sort of an educated, I'm not going to say guess, but um, you have to take an educated position on what you think the call uh, behavior of various issuers is going to be because they're not able they're not able to disclose specifically that they're going to call a transaction in advance um, because that would be you know, material price sensitive information if they were to release that um, they tend to tell you when they're going to call a transaction a month before they're going to call it. Um, there's normally a 30-day notice period they have to give and um, apart from that you have to work from your experience with the issuer. Um, so we talked about how you have income being applied from the, the top of the transaction gets paid to the senior notes first before it gets paid to the junior notes. Now the other thing that makes the senior notes more safe um, is the fact that losses uh, can only be applied to them after they've gone through uh, a fair few other lines of defence first. Now the first line of defence um, against losses is, I'm going to disagree with this slide a tiny bit and apologies for that, um, but actually the over collateralization that you have um, on the underlying line. So the idea that the LVR of the line is probably only 70% which makes it difficult to to realize a loss. If you only need to get 70% of the value of that property when you foreclose upon it, um, that, that reduces the chance that you, get, um, that you get a loss. The second line of defense that exists in a lot of RMBS transactions, particularly a lot of prime RMBS transactions in Australia is um, lender's mortgage insurance. This is essentially a, um, an insurance policy that the borrower pays for but actually benefits um, you know, the bank or the lending institution. This says that if um, the bank forecloses on this property and can't get the full value of uh, the mortgage back, then the insurer uh, will pay out that amount. The next line of defense you've got is that periodic excess spread that we talked about. So the extra income that's being charged on all the underlying mortgages that is in excess of the amount that's required to pay senior trust expenses and then interest on the senior and junior notes. Now, if you have a loss and it doesn't get covered by any of those things, then the next thing you do is you write down the value of the junior notes. Um, and it's only, the only way that you can have a loss uh, impact a more senior class of note is if the junior class of note has been wholly um, written off. Uh, and there's one final thing that helps improve your security position. It's the fact that even once you've written off a junior note, uh, for either a portion or in its entirety, to the extent that there is any excess spread uh, you know, or profit in future periods, that amount gets used to replenish the value of those junior notes. So what you see is that you do have a you know, particularly strong security position within these structures, um, 
ensuring that losses are allocated first to several um, features that are outside of the transaction wholly, um, and then even within the transaction, they go through excess spread first, um, and then they go through any any junior um, note which which might sit beneath you. So we're going to have a brief discussion about the ratings agencies because they are important in securitization markets because they do some pretty rigorous analysis. Um, we actually had an article run in The Wire this week which talks through exactly and explicitly uh, how ratings agencies do rate RMBS transactions and I think if you, if you listen to this and you find that you didn't wholly get everything that I was saying or you want a bit more detail about it, I highly recommend having a look at that article. But broadly speaking, their attitude to rating RMBS transactions comes down to um, this fundamental idea. They say that the only way you have losses uh, that have to be levied against RMBS notes is if you have losses under the underlying mortgages. Um, if I want to measure the quantum of losses that I'll have on the underlying mortgages, well there are two things that I really care about. One is how many of these mortgages do I think are going to default and the second is when they default, how much money do I think I'm going to lose um, on each of those mortgages. So we call the first one the weighted average foreclosure frequency, so that's how many of them are going to default. Um, we're going to call the second one the weighted average loss severity, on average how much money am I going to lose on each of those mortgages. Um, and then what they do is that for each different level um, of, of rating, they apply a stress scenario um, for the lower ratings, like a single B rating, it's not particularly hectic. Um, and then for the higher ratings, a AAA rating for example, you really start talking about disaster scenarios. If we're to look at Standard & Poor's um, by way of example, if you're looking at the AAA level of mortgage market stress that they apply um, in determining their weight average foreclosure frequency and their weight average loss severity, um, they look at what they call an average mortgage. So this is for between 200 grand and 500 grand, it's in a metro area, so it's not in the city, it's not in the country. Uh, it's uh, a standalone house, it's not a unit, it's not a townhouse, it's not a villa. Um, it's occupied by someone who is full-time employed, uh, they're full dock, they've got prime um, credit history and they, you know, they look at a pool of 10,000 loans that look like that, so very vanilla, very uh, sort of normal, very usual. And they say that in my AAA level of, my AAA stress scenario, I think that one in 10 of them is going to default on their mortgage. So let's just like imagine one in 10 mortgage borrowers in Australia defaulting on their mortgage. We're looking at a pretty dire scenario. And I think that property prices are going to decline by 45%. Um, from when the loans were originated. So what we see is that they're applying a really quite quite hectic and stressful um, level of stress to the underlying assets to the extent that the actual borrowers differ in a meaningful way um, from that idealized uh, borrower, then they adjust. So they say, for example, if you didn't have a perfect credit history, then I'm going to assume it's not a 10% likelihood that you're going to default. It's going to be a 14% likelihood. If you live in the country, if you live in an apartment in the inner city, they're going to say, well, I don't think there's going to be a 45% decline in property. I'm going to um, see what this would look like if there was a 52% decline in property. And they go through. Um, and by looking at the entire pool, they can generate an expected level of loss under each of those stress scenarios. If we jump to the next slide, we can see you know, hypothetically what that would look like. Um, so here, this gives an example for a non-conforming transaction where under a AAA level of stress, um, the ratings agencies would expect for a 16.7 odd um, percent foreclosure frequency. That's to say that 16.7 percent of the borrowers in the pool would be expected to default under that AAA um, scenario of stress. And the dollar value that you'd lose on each of those mortgages um, would be 49% of what you'd lent to them. So they'd say if you've got that happen, which is just like 
a hectic disaster scenario, then you'd require 8.2% uh, of the transaction to be sitting underneath you to absorb those losses. And then it goes through and that table shows um, what those numbers look like at various other um, you know, ratings levels of you know, less hectic stress scenarios, if you like. Um, and what we see is that this means that in order to put a AAA uh, rating on a tranche in an RMBS structure with these underlying loans, you'd have to have at least 8.21% of the transaction providing equity. The important thing to think about here is that this analysis wholly ignores um, any benefit that you might have on an incremental basis from excess spread going forward. And so I suppose we can, we can take this in a, a step further and we can look at um, how this works out. On the next slide, there's a graph which shows that obviously to the extent that you had a lower level of loss severity, then you'd be able to withstand a higher level of foreclosure frequency for um, you know, a given level of subordination. So that light blue line on the top right hand side, uh, which is marked AAA, imagine that's the instance where you've got the 8.21% subordination or equity sitting beneath you that can get burnt up um, before you have to wear any losses. Well, that means that if you have a loss severity of 49%, then you could have you know, up to around about 15% of the transaction uh, default. However, if the loss severity were to be lower, uh, if you were to have a loss severity of only say 25%, then you'd be able to deal uh, with substantially more of the pool uh, defaulting. So you'd be able to deal with, uh, from this graph, you'd see about 23%. Um, it's worth pointing out that this graph is, is reasonably approximate, but it shows the, sort of the robustness that having subordinated notes sitting underneath you which can absorb losses before they hit you um, provides to your security position within an RMBS structure. Now that's the fundamental work that ratings agencies do and as we go through um, to the next slide, we can just see you know, the other things that they cover up on. Now obviously there's a reasonably um, complex and long legal structure that sits behind these transactions. They sort of ensure that uh, that's going to do what it says it's going to do. Um, they kick its tires if you like. They go through and have a look at all those participants in the structure that we talked about before uh, and they ensure that they're all up to scratch. Um, and they often will provide explicit ratings on some of those uh, underlying you know, service providers to the trust. Uh, they ensure that the cash flow waterfall design is robust. That's the idea that you know, income firstly gets used to pay tax, it next gets used to pay trust expenses, it next gets used to pay senior interest and on and on and on. Um, they ensure that and they stress the, uh, they stress the transactions uh, for liquidity purposes to ensure that even if you were to have a stress event with you know, a severe number of mortgages going into arrears for a short period of time, it would still be able to cope with that um, and maybe request that the issuer of the transaction actually include some special reserve accounts to help account for issues like that and they make sure that any hedge counterparties are appropriately rated um, so that you don't have any dependencies on them which could uh, which could hurt you. And what this means is that the ratings that we see coming out on structured products in Australia in particular um, are really robust. And I think the other thing that's important to mention is that you know, RMBS after, um, or unstructured products in general after the GFC were often considered you know, a bit of a dirty word if you like. Uh, however, since then you've had the ratings agencies really tighten up their standards and make uh, the ratings that they give substantially more conservative. Um, and I think when you look through to what individual ratings are actually saying about the explicit assets that sit behind them and the sort of levels, levels of stress that they'd be able to withstand, um, I think you can derive a high degree of confidence um, from their validity. And so I suppose having talked through all of that, um, before we open it up to, to more questions, we're going to just step you through a brief example um, of a transaction that we've done recently. Now, as I mentioned at the start, <coughs> this is actually almost word for word um, an email that I wrote to dealers um, at FIG or you know, the salesman at FIG on Monday or Tuesday this week about an offer that we um, 
had available for them to show to their clients. And it's going to track pretty closely to what you're going to see get offered to you as we go forward. Um, and the sort of things that I tend to tell you about a transaction or that we tend to tell you about a transaction. And we're just going to walk through so we can have a look at um, you know, exactly what's important here um, when, when you're reading these sorts of notes. So we'll let you know the rating of it pretty upfront. Um, obviously that's important and gives you a, a quick way to calibrate exactly what I'm looking at. Am I looking at a, you know, a junior note and a prime transaction? Am I looking at a, uh, you know, a subordinated note and a non-conforming transaction? You, know, you tend to be able to tell pretty well what you're looking at by having a look at the rating. So this is AA rated and it says that it's from a non-conforming transaction. So what this means is that it's going to be quite near the top of the capital structure um, in, in a non-conforming transaction. That means it's non-prime. As it turns out, um, this is from the Sapphire 2007-1 transaction, which was bought by Bluestone Mortgages, who specialised in, um, in, in subprime mortgages or non-conforming mortgages, as we sort of prefer to call them. Um, and then we identified the tranche, so it's the MA tranche, and you tend to have uh, a pretty generic set of names that you, you call each tranche in a prime transaction. The most senior tranche will be the A note. You'll then have a MES tranche, which is also AAA rated, which is called an AB note. And then you'll have the junior note, which will be called a B note, often split into two different um, sort of sub tranches, a B1 and a B2. Uh, with non-conforming transactions, they tend to just go A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then uh, interestingly, some of the originators have their own sort of naming conventions. For Bluestone, an MA tranche sits uh, towards the top of the middle, if you like. Now they benefit from $28.1 million of subordination, equaling 26.7% of the deal. So that tells me that there's a little more, a little more than $100 million of mortgages left in this transaction, and that underneath the MA tranche, there's $28.1 million worth of other tranches uh, that can absorb losses before me as the MA note uh, would ever be subjected to having to have any of them levied against me myself. This is up from 9.7% when the transaction was, I think that should read originated. Um, this is to say that when the transaction was first brought in 2007, that $28.1 million of subordination represented a little under 10% of the transaction. Because of how the transaction has paid down since then, it now represents 26.7% of the transaction. So proportionally, the amount of loss buffer that you have there supporting uh, your credit position has you know, times by two and a half. Um, and interestingly, the ratings agencies haven't improved the rating on this, uh, which would suggest that you know it's double A rated, which is a really strong rating to start with. But even that soft, you'd, you know, I suggest that this would be double A plus, or even you know an equivalent of a triple A rated credit. Now the next line is the really important one, where it says that given the current LVR profile of the pool, this means that if every property defaulted and you could sell the properties for forty one percent of what they were worth in two thousand and seven, then the MA notes would get all their money back. And this is a pretty common uh, sort of scenario that I'll put in front of investors. So we talk about every single one of the properties defaulting. Obviously that's you know, a pretty outrageous assumption. Um, we, we touched briefly earlier on the fact that if you were to have even 10% of properties default, that would be a disaster scenario. Here we go, you know, just for the purpose of showing how incredibly robust the security position is here, if you had every single property default. Um, we're going to show you what would have to happen in order for you to lose money. And what would have to happen is that you'd have to have the amount that you could sell the property for decrease by over 59% from where these properties were valued in 2007. Obviously that's a you know, huge, almost unthinkable uh, you know, decline in property prices, particularly considering what's happened to property prices between 2007 and today, where they've increased substantially. Finally, we note just as of you know, broads of average statistic, the weighted average loan to value ratio of the portfolio is 64.1%. So you know, the average mortgage has 35% money down on what they paid for it, which is uh, you know, pretty substantial skin of the game for any borrowers. Now we then go through and tell you a little bit about the, the issuer and you know, things specific to this transaction. So we talk about the fact that Bluestone failed to call um, its RMBS issues after the GFC. Um, however, it started issuing a new transaction uh, at the end of 2013, which allowed for it to clean up 
a few legacy transactions, uh, and then we give you some scenario analysis. So we say, if this transaction were never to get called, if it were just to pay down naturally, then the then that scenario, if you were to buy this transaction, sorry, if you were to buy these notes at the price that they're available, you'd generate a return of BBSW plus one and a half percent, and you'd have a 3.6 year weighted average life of the transaction. So some of the principal is going to get repaid to you tomorrow, some of your principal is going to get repaid to you uh, longer than 3.6 years because it's going to work out at 3.6 years on average. Um, and then the second scenario we present to you is if you were uh, to get called in one year's time, then this transaction would generate your return of BBSW plus 4.32% with a weighted average life of under a year. So that's obviously a substantially more uh, compelling uh, risk return sort of you know, opportunity and that gives you an opportunity to sit back, have a look at those two different scenarios and make a judgment call as to how comfortable you are of the likelihood of Bluestone, who's got a sketchy call history, um, calling this transaction you know, within the next year or two years or three years or never and what that's going to mean for your return and whether you're comfortable to invest given the sort of risk metrics that we've got at the top. Um, and then we just have a, you know, a little bit reinforcing the risk of the transaction because we're really not sort of that interested in overselling these. I want to make sure that everyone who invests in these transactions are fully aware of, of what they're getting into. And now when we send when we send uh, notes like this around, we, we tend to attach a couple of things. Uh, we tend to attach the latest investor report, and that'll give you a whole lot of pool statistics. It'll tell you, you know, where the mortgages are located. It'll tell you, uh, you know, what the interest rates they're charging on various um, products are. It'll tell you how many of these people are full doc borrowers, how many are low doc borrowers, um, you know, how many of them are, uh, you know, have perfect credit histories, what their arrears levels on the transaction are, etc. We'll also send you the full program documentation, so like the information memorandum that actually underlies it. For those of you who are interested in you know, digging in and getting into all the mechanics um, of the transaction. And finally, we'll send you some sort of idealized cash flows. So here are, here are two screen grabs of the cash flows that we sent around with this note on Tuesday. At the top, you see uh, the cash flows if it were to get called in a year. Um, and at the bottom you see the start of the cash flows for if it weren't to get called in the year and it would just stay outstanding. So let's walk through these a little bit and have a look at what they show us. Um, capital price, obviously that's what you have to pay for it. Accrued interest is how much interest has accrued on these bonds since the last coupon payment date um, and you've sort of got to pay for that up front and that gives you your, your total gross price. Uh, we talked about the original face value. Um, of the bond. In this instance, we had $1.411 million of it on offer. However, because principal repays over the life of the transaction, as we've discussed, you've actually had the vast majority of that, about you know, a little over a million dollars, already be repaid to you. So the only principal that's left is $365,000 here. And so you, the amount that you pay for this is Ninety-six fifty plus the accrued interest on the three hundred and sixty-five odd thousand dollar um, remaining principal balance. In this instance, that works out at uh, three hundred and fifty-three thousand nine hundred ninety dollars and thirty-six cents. In the top right-hand corner, we get a couple of uh, return statistics. Um, that's the IRR that it would generate. Uh, the spread. That's the margin over BBSW that it's expected to return. Uh, the wall is that weighted average life that we talked about. So it's sort of like equivalent of a, an average maturity date for the principal um, in the transaction. And then the annual CPR is an assumption which sort of we you know, heavily predicates the cash flows that are generated. So that's the amount of principal that we forecast to be repaid in a given 12, you know, on rolling 12 month period. So we talked about 20% being the average. You're buying this at a discount. So the faster principal comes back to you, the better. That's why I've used 18.5% because we always try to make it look a little less good um, than, we, than we think it actually will be. We sort of would prefer to over promise, sorry, under promise um, and over deliver with the return metrics that we show clients here. Um, underneath there, you actually see what the predicted forward cash flows are. Um, the various components, what we forecast the interest rate to be, um, and that's a function of you know, today's swap markets. Um, 
how much principal we expect to get repaid in a period, how much interest we expect to get paid in a period, and then your net cash flow. Um, finally, for those of you who like doing your own NPV match, we NPV maths, um, we, we include the figures there for you for you to um, check our numbers. The bottom, you've got all those same things repeated, but it's just assuming that the transaction isn't going to get called in a year and it remains outstanding. So okay, Henry, we have um, a question actually from Gary. And he says that he notes it's uh, normal to quote the IRR return. And he um, is wondering if you can just explain that a little bit better, how that's calculated. Right. So I'd, I'd suggest that when you're looking at RMBS, I would I would caution against looking at an IRR. I'd, I'd depend substantially more on that spread metric uh, because this is an FRN and so that's just more, more relevant. But in order to generate that IRR, we take today's swap rates and we use that to forecast what the market's telling us it expects for forward BBSW rates to be. So what the market expects for the 30-day BBS or the 90-day BBSW rate in this instance to be in nine months' time. Uh, using that, we add the, the coupon margin on these notes. In this case, it's 36 basis points. So if you look in the period that ends on the 14th of January 2015, uh, we forecast that the 90-day forward BBSW rate for that period will be 2.675%. You add uh, the 36 basis point coupon margin and you're getting a coupon of 3.04%. You're having that paid on $307,133.33 of remaining principal and that works out at $2,489. Um, of interest being paid. We've got an 18.5% CPR, um, which would lead to an expectation that $18,185.87 of principal would get repaid, giving you a total net cash flow of a little over $20,000. Now, by forecasting all of these uh, cash flows and the dates that we're going to uh, be receiving them on, we're able to calculate an IRR. Sort of the, the simplest way to tell you how we calculate an IRR would be to say that it's the discount rate at which the net present value of, the sum of the net present value of all the cash flows associated um, with the transaction is equal to zero. Um, and, and what we see here in this instance is that in the top example where it gets called within a year, you'd have an expected IRR of 7.19%. In the bottom, uh, scenario where it never gets called, um, you'd have expected IR of 4.99%. So it's simply a matter of predicting the future cash flows which we'd expect to receive and then combining that with the price that we're being asked to pay for it today, um, being able to sort of quite intuitively figure out what return that you know, cash flow profile would generate. Okay, Henry, we have another question from Han, um, and he wants to know how does a potential investor gauge the relative value of RMBS issues given the absence of price transparency and because of low market liquidity and also the uncertainty of when you're actually going to be repaid? I do like me a nine-part question. Um, <laughs> I suppose there are Okay. I, suppose there are, I suppose there are a couple of different ways we can approach this. Um, when we're talking about how an investor can get confidence in, um, in the relative value of RMBS opportunities, you can look at that in two different ways. You can say, how can I compare the relative value of an RMBS opportunity to other fixed income opportunities or other investment opportunities that I'm being shown? Um, and then you can have a look at how can I sort of identify relative value opportunities within the RMBS space. Let's touch on the first one first because that seems logical. Um, I think what we've talked through today is some of the ways that you can begin to assess the credit quality of RMBS transactions and what I'd argue is that they're extremely robust and if you look at where these trade, um, I think they, they trade wide for, um, for the credit quality that they offer. And so you can get a feel for what you believe the credit quality of any of these RMBS transactions to be and you can have a look at the returns on offer and you can compare that to um, 
things that offer a similar return and what the credit quality of those are. I would suggest that um, if I'm looking at something with a, if I'm looking at a brand new transaction that comes, you know, that came two weeks ago, uh, you had a triple A rated note, uh, so an AB note, price at 160 basis points over swap. It had a weighted average life of five years. It triple A rated five years. Um, it's paying, you know, 160 points over over swap. If I go and look at ALE Finance, they're a triple B rated um, owner and sort of roll up operator of pubs um, around the country. They just issued six year paper at 170 over and they're triple B rated. So if I'm looking at triple A rated 150 over five year, triple B rated six year, you know, 170 over, that sounds like a compelling relative value story to me. Now within the RMBS space, it's sort of substantially easier to compare uh, you know, one credit to another because you've got you know, the same underlying fundamentals. And so identifying relative value within the RMBS space, I think um, becomes easier. With respect to price to transparency, I'd say the market does tend to price substantially off the new issue market um, where there is substantial price transparency because A, they're printing a large transaction uh, and B, they're getting price tension in volume. Um, and you can have a look at the notes that you, know, you hold or are considering purchasing and looking at the returns that are offered on them relative to the primary market and get a pretty good feel um, for, for what your relative value is within the RMBS space. Now there was a final comment um, that was part of the, the question which was, you know, this is challenging in a context that I don't know when this is going to mature. Um, and, and yes, I think that's a thing you need to be comfortable with, um, with, with RMBS. In the same way with other callable securities, you do have the right to call being at the option of the issuer. Um, with RMBS or a lot of RMBS, those issued by any ADIs, authorised deposit taking institutions, read banks and credit unions. Um, you know, you don't even have a hard date on which it's callable. You've got it dependent on the transaction paying down to only having 10% of its original value outstanding. Um, that is that is a difficulty that's inherent with RMBS, and it's a level of uncertainty that you have to get comfortable with as an investor if you're um, wanting to come in here. I'd say that it's reasonably minor. Okay, Henry, we've got a, a couple of other questions and I think it's a, a good time to ask them. So uh, Peter has asked, to participate in this particular note, was it necessary to invest the $353,990.36 or does it come in smaller parcels? Right, so I regret that the answer to this question is yes and no. Uh, what we do with RMBS is uh, if we have good supply um, in a particular line that we think offers compelling relative value, then we will um, go to the effort of making that a direct bond, usually um, available in parcels of 50 or 100,000 is where I tend to cap it out, um, just because they do tend to be quite intensive with, you know, we give investors who invest in RMBS the opportunity to, uh, as Han will know, um, ask uh, me and other RMBS analysts here at FIG um, you know, pretty extensive questions if they do have any about it. Because of that, we sort of try to avoid taking them down to ten thousand dollar parcels and leave it at fifty or a hundred. In the instance of these sapphire notes, um, we've got a pretty strong following uh, within some of our legacy clients here at Fig in sapphire transactions. Um, people who understand them very well and are able to respond to these sort of offers quite quickly and they tend to act in you know, pretty substantial volume. Uh, so in this instance, we didn't go to the effort of breaking it down into small parcels because I was pretty confident that it was going to move even as a three hundred and sixty or three hundred and fifty five thousand dollar parcel pretty quickly. As it turned out, it went in about you know, six minutes. <laughs> 
Okay, I think that's a pretty interesting point, Henry, because really the demand inherent within FIG, within our existing um, investor base. So if you're new to RMBS and you're interested, it's definitely worth registering with your dealer saying, I'm interested, please let me know when some of this uh, becomes available, because it's, it is fairly tightly held, isn't it? Yeah, well, I'd say that you know, the instance of it moving you know, as quickly as that would be quite rare, but uh, you know, it an entire line moving within you know the space of an afternoon or you know a few hours even isn't particularly unusual to the extent that this is an area that you're interested in um, I definitely make sure that yeah you let your um, you let your fig representative your fixed income salesman know um, of your interest to make sure that when any notes about prospective transactions you know that are available get sent out across the desk he knows that um, you, know, you want that to be forwarded along as soon as possible um, so that you've got an opportunity to consider it. Okay, great. I've got a couple of um, other questions. One from George and he asks, are RMBS traded at all or does the investor need to hold until they're called? And uh, a secondary sort of question that ties in a little bit from Han asking, is there any kind of secondary market in it? RMBS and are the spreads very wide? So not quite the nine point question but there's a few points there for you Henry. Yeah, so like I think almost all um, products that FIG offers, yes there's a secondary market. Um, when we're able to offer these to you, we're sourcing them from the secondary market and, um, and, and selling them to you. Um, with respect to liquidity I'd say if you were to look at RMBS, particularly junior notes of RMBS as an asset class, um, you would not be able to say that it's a particularly liquid one. However, at the same time, I'd argue that FIG has a particular knack at providing liquidity as and when it's required. Uh, with respect to the spreads, um, FIG has a you know, broad and ongoing quest to make the spreads that we charge as transparent as sort of possible. Um, these sort of transactions are reported in our transparency report. Um, I'd say given the high level of individual analysis and sort of a high level of customer service that we provide in answering investors' questions when it comes to RMBS. Um, we do tend to charge a slightly um, higher spread than for regular bonds, however, you know, not necessarily materially so. Um, the actual spread that's going to be charged is going to vary based on a variety of factors, um, you know, how esoteric the transaction is, how long the transaction's got to go, etc. Um, so you know, there are a wide sorry, variety of factors that you know, feed into that ultimate, um, that ultimate amount. The final thing I'd say is that when we offer you an investment in you know, anything at FIG, and you know, this is also the case in RMBS, the price that you see and the return metrics that you see there um, are a net of any spread that we're taking. Um, and so you don't have to pay anything in additional uh, to that amount. Okay, great Henry, we've still got some more questions coming in and um, here's one uh, from Gary again, just wanting about wanting to talk about how he um, compares and what are the main things he should look at when he's assessing a deal and he's saying, would, so would you actually be looking more at spread and rating as opposed to that um, internal rate of return if you're assessing a, a new issue or a new, new deal? Yeah, so the internal rate of return is not a hugely useful metric um, in comparing various products which have different terms to maturity. Um, just because you've got a, a base level of risk-free interest rates which sits, on, which sits underneath that. That's why you know, a spread metric I think is you know, substantially more valuable if you're comparing anything that has um, you know, a different maturity date. And I'd, I'd argue that's probably true across um, all of your fixed income holdings. As far as what you want to be looking for uh, when you're considering investing in a transaction, I think we'll highlight it pretty well to you in the, in the summary information that we send you about the transaction. It's here are, here are the, you know, the key positive things about this transaction and here are the key risks and where it can go wrong. What you're really looking for uh, is 
what sort of transaction it is. Is it non-conforming? Is it a prime transaction? Looking for whether it has any benefit from mortgage insurance. You want to ensure that it's well diversified. You want to make sure that you've got an appreciation of the arrears history of that transaction and whether there have been any losses um, which have been incurred and how well they've been dealt with. I'd say they're the key things. You then probably want to have a look at the fact that you want to be very aware of whether you're buying this at a discount or a premium given the prepayment risk. Um, the real risk is that you know if you buy something at a discount and it repays more slowly than you expect, um, then obviously that's going to be dilutive to your return. You want to avoid that. The opposite is the case if you're buying something at a premium. Um, I suppose the one other thing I didn't mention there um, that is quite important is you want to be aware of who the sponsor of the transaction is. So who was that originating bank who, who sits behind it? Um, and that's for a variety of reasons. One is you, you know, have higher confidence in certain originators and the quality of the mortgages that they write. Uh, you also um, have higher confidence in their ability to call the transaction um, or you know, better knowledge of what their call behaviour is going to be like um, you know, if you know who the issuer is. And feel free to, if you get shown something like this, ask questions if you don't think you're being given everything that you need. Um, you know, if you were to get sent this and didn't know who Bluestone was, go back to your dealer and say, who's Bluestone? What's their story? What's their history like? Tell me a bit about them. That dealer's going to um, come through to me or Tony, who's the sort of head of um, this part of the business, and, and we'll give you a response. Um, and you know, we sort of pride ourselves on having a pretty personal level of service um, when it comes to RMBS. Okay, fantastic, um, Henry. Thank you so much for the comprehensive answers. Now we're running down on our timer here. Uh, and if it does stop on us, thank you for joining us today. I did want to try and slip in one uh, last question from Larry. In fact, some very good questions. And he's wondering why, why the Sapphire um, notes become available and do you know how much is available and why weren't the original investors staying in? Right, in this instance, um, really simple answer, it's a fund who bought them when they were a pretty distressed asset in 2009 at a substantial discount and he's cleaning up his accounts pre-30 June because um, that's how he's, you know, that, that that's in, like where you land at the end of the year is an important thing for a fund um, and that's, you know, things like that can drive supply. Um, in reality, um, you know, this is a special instance why sort of that supply is available. In general, when these become um, available in the secondary market, it can be for a whole heap of reasons. It can be mandate changes within funds, it can be um, you know, that the house view within that fund has changed on this type of RMBFs and so um, you know, they now want to change the weighting they hold it. There are a whole variety of reasons. It may be that you know, it's an existing FIG holder um, who's a high net worth or a self-managed super fund and they need to um, you know, buy a boat or a house go on a holiday um, and they need to liquidate some of their stock. There are a variety of reasons why people can sell them in this particular instance with these sapphires. Um, you know, this was a credit fund that's uh, trying to book some profits pre-30 June. Okay, great. Do you want to just wind up now, Henry, please? Yeah, I think here's a, here's a nice final slide which t tells you things that we've said a few times already. Um, but I think if there are two things that I want to, you know, I'd like for everyone to take away from this um, presentation, it's one, you know, I generally do believe that they offer a compelling relative value proposition and you know, if you look at what equivalently rated products, um, you know, the margins that they trade out and compare that to RMBS, it just stacks up really aggressively. Um, and then the second thing is just to remember what the things are that improve your security position. And you've got credit enhancement coming from four key sources. One, you've got the fact that the underlying loans, um, you know, the borrowers haven't borrowed the full value of their property. Two, you've got mortgage insurance on a lot of RMBS transactions um, which cover any losses which arise from those underlying loans. Three, you've got ongoing excess spread which is being generated in the transaction which can cover any losses that don't get knocked out by those first two. And finally, in a lot of instances, you'll have junior notes which sit underneath you which you know, effectively act as equity to absorb any losses before you get hit. Um, that's, a, that's a lot of security that you have improving your position um, and I think when you combine you know, the really strong credit metrics of a lot of RMBS transactions with the margins that they're paying and you compare it to other things in the market, um, they look very attractive. Henry, thank you very much for stepping in and presenting on behalf of Tony today. I think you've done an excellent job. Clearly you are 
very ha knowledgeable on RMBS and uh, there were some difficult questions which you answered extremely well and uh, I'm sure some of our listeners would like to hear more from you and, and a bit more in-depth analysis but um, I want to say thank you very much uh, for presenting today and equally thank you very much to uh, all the listeners. Please, if you have any questions, call uh, your local dealer or in fact you can call and, and speak to Henry, our expert. Uh, thank you very much. This now concludes the presentation. Good afternoon. <laughs>